Hello everybody, a happy feast day of the Transfiguration to you all. And as always, I'd like to give a special greeting to our Holy Redeemer, St. Ferdinand and St. Gregory parishioners. For those of you who are involved in ministry, music ministry in terms of an ensemble, this is normally the time of year where we start uh, thinking about getting back together for rehearsals and, and scratching out blocks of our time so that we can prepare uh, music for the celebration of the liturgy. And because of all of the precautions of this pandemic, we're simply not able to gather as choirs, ensembles, uh, bands, things of that nature. So uh, I would just like to, to give a word of thought and prayer to all of you who would ordinarily be coming back to minister at your parish communities. Uh, and uh, we know uh, that we all want to be back together soon. For those of you who are interested in uh, church history or church trivia, uh, the Feast of the Transfiguration today uh, marks the uh, 42nd anniversary of what came to be known as the Year of Three Popes. It was on this feast day, the Feast of the Transfiguration, August 6, 1978, that Pope Paul VI had a heart attack while he was at the papal summer residence of uh, Castel Gandolfo, and uh, he died on August 6th. The conclave that selected the Pope to succeed him picked the Patriarch of Venice, Albino Luciani, who took the name of John Paul I. His nickname, affectionately so, was the Smiling Pope. And after 30, 33 days of reigning on the throne of St. Peter, Pope John Paul I had a massive heart attack and died in his sleep. And uh, shortly thereafter, the Cardinals found themselves, uh, found themselves once again in Rome uh, for the second conclave. And we all, of course, know that out of that conclave came uh, the election of Carol Wojtyla, who had been the Archbishop of Krakow, who took the name of John Paul I, and he reigned from 1978 until 2005. For people like me, up until his death, Pope John Paul II was the only pope that we knew. Uh, I remember the days after Pope Benedict XVI was elected, watching him don the papal vestments and carry the papal staff and just thinking, this is all just so weird seeing somebody dressed like that and it's not John Paul II. So the year of three popes in 1978 all started 42 years ago on this date with the death of Paul VI, who incidentally this past year became Saint Paul VI. He was canonized by uh, Pope Francis. In the account of the gospel today in the, the Transfiguration, we see that Jesus takes uh, Peter, James, and John up the mountain, and Jesus is transfigured before them, and he appears with Moses and Elijah, and it, there is this radiance to him, and he is seen, Jesus is seen by the apostles in all of his glory. And of course, the apostles say, Lord, it's great to be here. Let's build three tents, let's stay on this mountain of glory forever. And eventually Jesus says, we've got to go back down to reality, essentially. And in one of the last lines of the gospel, Jesus tells the disciples something that almost seems contradictory to us as people of faith. He, they're coming off the mountain, and Jesus says, don't tell anybody about this until a later time. And when you think about it, isn't that kind of opposite of what we're kind of always told. We are, uh, at essence, a, an evangelical church. It is our mission to go out to the entire world and tell people, Jesus is the Son of God, he has died for your sins, and he loves you. But Jesus does the exact opposite here. He says, don't tell anybody about this. And you know, the apostles were human beings with their own faults and shortcomings, just like everybody else. And the um, 
sarcastic side of me really wonders if when they came down off of the mountain, if Peter or James or John went up to the other nine apostles and said, oh my, we just had this really cool experience on the top of the mountain. It was really awesome, but I can't tell you about it. Um, I just wonder if that happened. I would, I would chuckle to think that perhaps it did. I mean, we of course know from other scriptures that uh, there were some uh, rivalries and some discussions on uh, which apostle uh, was the greatest of them. Uh, so I can completely see Peter or James or John kind of rubbing it into the other apostles. I got to see something really cool and you didn't and I can't tell you about it, so ha ha ha. When I stop to think about that command of Jesus, don't tell anybody about it. I have to imagine that even if Peter or James or John didn't didn't breathe a word about it to anybody, I can't imagine that after having witnessed something like that, that you couldn't just tell something was different with them. By the way they acted, maybe by uh, things that they started to do differently, having beheld this, this vision of Christ in all of his glory with Moses and Elijah. And when I start to think along those lines, then the words of Jesus, don't tell anybody about this, begin to make a little more sense for me. Don't tell anybody about this. But go and live your lives as changed people. Don't tell anybody about this. One of my favorite quotes of St. Francis of Assisi was his charge to his followers, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. That unlocks Jesus telling the disciples, don't tell anybody about this, live it, live it. In one of his writings, Pope Benedict uh, talks about how people don't want um, professorial types in their life. They're not impressed by that. What people are impressed with are witnesses. People are impressed not about the talk that you talk, but the walk that you walk. And isn't that one of the reasons why so many people are enamored with, with Pope Francis? Because here's a guy, servant of the servants of God, that actually seems to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. And for me, that's kind of how I view what Jesus was telling those disciples. Go live it. Go live it. Sure, you're going to have to talk about it at some point, but go be witnesses. Go do the things that I'm asking you to do. Live the way I'm asking you to live. Put your money where your mouth is. Walk the walk. And that's not something that we have an opportunity to do every day of our lives, because whether or not the name of Jesus crosses our lips in front of somebody else or not, we are, by the manner in which we live our lives, preaching at every moment. We are preaching the gospel. One of the options for the priest or deacon to say in dismissing the assembly from the Eucharistic liturgy um, is, Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your lives. And we all say thanks be to God. We, every time we come to Mass, are sent back out into that world, not just because we've put in our hour's worth of time on a Sunday, not because we sang every note of the hymn and prayed every word of the responses, not because we did our lip service, we are sent out to then live the gospel, glorify the Lord, not by only our speech, but by our lives. And so I am going to take a page out of my own reflection just now, and in a very uncharacteristic way for me, uh, end this reflection uh, before uh, 15 minutes, which is, you all know, is, is highly unlike me so that we all can go out from wherever we happen to be right now into a world, preaching the gospel at all times, using words when necessary. Don't tell anybody about this. 
live it. Live it and let it be evident. God bless you all.